We have Michael making moves on a maiden with mixed messages. We got Jam joining jobs. We got Dwight defying Daryl. I don't know why I made all of those alliterations. Hey, I'm Chris. Welcome to The Office Field Guide. I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever, and today we're looking at body language. My dad? Warning! <laughs> warning! Warning! I understand nothing. Yeah, so body language is kind of a filler episode, so if you're having a hard time remembering it, here's a quick rundown. What the hell is a rundown? Did somebody order a hooker over here? People don't just take barrettes off. It's not a signal. It's just a coincidence. No, it's not even a coincidence. It's just something that happened. She's not interested in you. You are right. How do I apply? Uh, you have to be a minority. This is Hidetoshi Hasegawa. I snagged an Indian for the program. She'll be the first. The program's mostly black. It's Almost too black. I never forget anything. All right, so this episode was written by Justin Spitzer, who went on from here to write other shows and became a showrunner creator of Superstore and the newly released American Auto, which as I was writing this was about four episodes in. And, you know, it's okay. It actually had some jokes and made me laugh out loud, which is a pretty hard thing to do. Overall, it's meh, but it's a first season and those can be hard to pin down. We'll see what happens. And while Body Language was written by Justin Spitzer, it was directed by Mindy Kaling, which might not seem like a big deal, but this was her very first television directing credits. In fairness, prior to this episode, she did direct the Subtle Sexuality webisodes, which does make me think that this is a reference to those. I love that denim jumpsuit you have. How oh. much? <laughs> Actually, I was thinking about clothes that I was just gonna give to Goodwill anyway. Great. And in Body Language, the character of Kelly does have some awesome moments to shine. I don't want to be offensive, but uh, may I ask you what that means? I do find that offensive, actually. And Dwight's intensity creates a fire under Daryl. And this line makes me wish that things would have played out very differently in season nine. Maybe one day I'll be sitting in Michael's chair. Wouldn't that be something? Dwight trying to fix his mistakes create another problem for himself. Very Iron Man 3-ish. If you'd have told me this morning that today I'd be creating a monster capable of my own destruction, I'd have thought you were referring to the ball Mose and I are trying to reanimate. We create our own demons. It's weird. I work for a very well-known global company, and we had an Indian CEO when this episode originally aired. And weirder for me at that time, I was in an elevator, and I noticed the dude in the elevator with me just happened to be the CEO of Adobe, who also happens to be an Indian fella. Certain people in this office are a little too obsessed with things from India. I was at their conference and he saw my badge and he said, oh, you work for, the you know, your CEO and I went to high school together. And I was like, yeah, Shantanu, I, I do know that. I didn't know what to say. Fast forward a couple years and I'm in Manhattan. City so nice they named it twice. Manhattan is the other name. And I'm taking an Uber to one of our tech hubs and I'm talking with the driver and he's like, oh, you work for, and I'm like, yeah. And he goes, that's weird. I went to high school with your CEO. I was like, yeah, that's weird. He was like, yeah. Not sure there's a bigger story there. It's just weird that I coincidentally met two randos who went to high school with the dude who's running the mega corp I work for. Weirder still, I think the CEO of Microsoft actually went to that high school too. I don't believe you. I never met him though, yet. By the way, I'm not embarrassed by where I work or anything. I just like to keep those two worlds separate. Because this world is your sanctuary, and if that world comes in contact Yes, with it world. blows up! Anyway, Amy Peetz was 41 when this episode was shot. But I work in the nightlife industry. I get hit on all the time. In my 20s, it would have been annoying. In my late 20s, I find it really flattering. But she's looking good. I mean, when she was in her early 20s, she was in that movie, Rudy, which I think this is a meta reference to. What sort of movie would Rudy have been if he had just stopped giving up after two rejections? And I think we talked about this before, but Krasinski is pretty fluent in Spanish. Buenos dias, Jaime. Buenos dias, Miguel. Como esta? Bien? Claro que si. Yo soy fantástico. Que pasa? It doesn't just sound aight. It sounds amazing. But Canonically, he's not really supposed to be, so maybe he's taken some Spanish courses since the night out. Nosotros trabajamos aquí, nos trancamos. Okay? They happen to speak Spanish. Fuck okay, yes. And just a quick reminder that a dude is running around Scranton just strangling people. 911, hello, Scranton Stranglers in the house. Inside the house. Not to death. I will strangle you, but I won't kill you. For the general take from the writers after the series ended, just. Strangling them till their life bar almost goes to E. 
There, I talked about the Scranton Strangler. <laughs> it's not Toby. And we get a joke about an unconscious association. I show her an image that turns her on. And then she looks at me, then she looks at the image, then back at me, then back at the image. Soon she doesn't know what is me, what is the image. She just knows that she's turned on. And it seems like the office writers love these types of jokes. Yes, Charles. Yes, you wanted me. I will try to manage my excitement. But I think with that, let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. It's been suggested that more than half of communication is from body language. <laughs> Did I purposefully intend to do audio only for this episode? No! No, but it's been snowing here for three days and I haven't gone outside at all and I'm kind of looking like an albino Papa Smurf. <laughs> but between facial expressions, eye movements, the mouth, hand gestures, posture, arm and leg placement, even personal space can be a variable to the tone of one's message. And reading body language gets even more complicated when you account for the fact that there are tons of national and regional variants to body language. Like I have a friend from Panama, shout out to Fernando, who had the hardest time dealing with Americans, especially us Midwesterners. New York. Fernando would come all up in my personal space and be like, Chris, I need to ask you a question. And then I back up. Yeah, what's up, buddy? He'd be like, I'm wondering if I could get a glass of water. Like, yeah, dude, just let me get you a cup. Thank you. I don't have uh, any other questions. <laughs> but, you know, body language is even more complicated when the messenger is sending mixed messages. And that's kind of what this episode is having fun with. So if you rewatch this entire episode, you're going to see that Donna is sending these mixed messages to flirt with Michael. Is she trying to get a good deal on a printer or is she incidentally flirting with Michael because, you know, she's attracted to him? Most printer sales are done over the phone, Ms. Boob Shirt. It's too bad that Dwight was busy with the Kelly stuff. Otherwise, he's supposed to be pretty good at detecting if someone's attracted to another person or not. Oh, slippery carpet. Losing my balance. Got to grab onto something. Wait. Okay. Look at the things she does in this episode. The way she's rubbing her ear. Her ears are like a seven and a four. Like she's just all the way turned on by Michael's message. Another example. Maybe she's just pushing her breasts together to make them look bigger. Like that? Body language is the reason why Daryl is drawn into this print in all colors initiative. Body language is how we know Ryan is using Kelly. Body language is how we know that Kelly is manipulating Gabe. Body language is the part of the reason why Hide doesn't need a translator. Why? I don't need to translate. You don't know what you need. And body language can reveal some of the nuances that exist between the internal desires that we all have and our external structure. And I've read more and more recently about how humans are able to interpret these messages subconsciously without ever even knowing what's happening. So if you ever get that gut feeling that something's just not right about something somebody's saying, it's probably your brain connecting neurons that are telling you that something is up, even though consciously you're not really sure what it is that's happening. Now you know how I feel sitting next to those M&Ms all day. Well, why don't you just move the M&Ms? Well, why don't you shut up? Okay. So with that, let's rate this thing. Don't act like you understood anything that guy said. This is the worst. <laughs> All right, honestly, the cold opening here is Michael going on vacation at some point in Cancun, and he wants to learn some Spanish. He's got Oscar helping him, but he can't quite get the hang of the gender stuff. La telefona. El teléfono. So he devises a system to help with that. I should have been more specific. The Cancun reveal is really funny. The rest of the cold opening just feels kind of blah. Ha ha! I'm going to give that a two out of five. Ah. And for body language itself, this one is kind of hit or miss for me. A lame attempt at humor, swing and a miss. I easily think the best part of this episode is Dwight. All of the Dwight. He's got the best talking heads in this episode. Just once, I would like to be a puppet master and have nothing go wrong. Is that too much to ask? Uh, glasses wearers, cholera survivors, geniuses, non-organic family farmers, 
the list goes on and on. You want me to keep going? Seeing Michael strike out again and again is just so hard to watch, but it is so well done. Like there's some consortium of... Michael! Oh, I'm sorry. And the payoff is amazing. Who? You were right. About what? You were right. I have your baguette. I did do it! And it all feels so complicated. Pam seems lively and is having some fun in this episode. I just delivered a baby. They didn't offer me a guarantee. And Jim seems oddly into his job. If you really want to impress your boss, you go in there and you do mediocre work. But it might be playing on the subplot that Jim is a good salesman and Pam isn't. You're, you're, good, you're good at sales. And I've been thinking about this for quite a while and I just can't pin it down. Something in this episode does feel off to me. Maybe it just feels dark. I, I don't really know, but I'm just not a big fan of this one. It gets a two out of five for me. I'll slap you in the face with a rainbow. Mm. But that's all I have to say about body language. What are your thoughts? I want to know what everybody else thinks about this episode. Next week, we have the cover up. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.